Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of my very first Let's Play. I am Foster, and this is Massive Chalice. I picked this game for my first Let's Play, one, because I really enjoy playing it, and two, I feel it's a really solid game that got overshadowed by a lot of uh, games in the same genre, like Fire Emblem and especially XCOM. It's a game similar to those in that it has the tactics-based conflict area where units die when they get to zero hit points and it's permadeath, but also has the fort building progression style aspect that like XCOM does where over time you build out your base and build out your forces and things. And we'll get into a lot of that as we play, but I think it's really, really cool and I'm happy to share it with you. So we're going to get started right here. And I've played this game a few times, but not 41 times. Uh, this is largely because I used starting new games to try to get levels on voice and recording and everything, and I actually had issues with it. And uh, Someday I might share some of the very, very poorly done recordings that exist from this uh, experiment to get myself to where we are. So we're going to rename our game, I think in the original uh, poorly recorded recording, I went with uh, McCool Land. So. Um, I think, I, I know, we'll go with Neo in the cool land. Yes, it's a new age and a new kind of cool. Alright, so Heroic Bloodline names. The game presents you with a lot of Bloodline names. You can name their houses, you get five of them. And they range from the, the serious ones, which are very, very fantasy-based and very, very awesome, to silly ones, which are silly. Um, they were named, They were suggested by the community. They are really, really cool. If you're a lore nerd like me, they really stand out. There's a lot of awesome references to different things. It's just really, really neat. We're going to go with serious ones for this game, and there are a lot of them, and we will take a look at them shortly. Difficulty, we're going to go with hard, because it's right in the middle of normal and brutal. So we'll go with hard. Uh, balance start, we're going to use because I have horrible, horrible RNG. And if I don't go with a balanced start, I'll wind up with like five alchemists or something and be completely unable to do anything useful. Which, while hilarious, would make this a very short let's play. Um, we're going to go with iron mode, because that's how you impress all the people on the internet. Uh, we're not going to use a tutorial, because like I said, I've played this game before, so we're going to be skipping that and just going straight ahead with our game. Alright, so here are the five houses that you get to select. There are many, many of them, as I mentioned, as you can see. Uh, you pick any letter, and there are a lot of them. They have a ton of different information for them. And as far as I know, these houses have no gameplay effect uh, individually. They function mostly as lore and kind of world building to sort of flesh out what you're seeing. And I picked five previously that I wanted to go with for this, this playthrough. I picked them based on having a variety of colors so that they're easy to tell apart, and also because I just really like the way these different ones look. I passed it. So we have Die Hard, which I'm going to go with. To cause laughter, to dominate. I really like that motto. And then we have... Rare Fury, because that looks really, really cool. And Freedom and Spirit. Next up... Lyrico, because happy cats are happy. At night, all cats are leopards. Perfect. And then this one is one of my personal favorites. It's, uh... There we are. Right? Miskatonic. Oh, this is... It's a great love letter to Lovecraft, and I love it. A lot of love going on right now. I'm sure that'll change shortly. Then the last one, only six Qs. This, we need we need more people who love Q and can make more Q naming things. Kavase, because I really like that flag, and because it's a very, very intelligent sort of thought-based group of people. So here's our five houses. The flags have variety to them, and we should be able to keep track of them pretty well. And now we're going to go into the intro, which I mostly won't talk during, just so you can enjoy the lore in the intro. And here we go.
It's taking too long. Patience. Patience? I don't see what patience has to do with this. It should have happened by now. Life keeps to its own timetable, not ours. Oh, it doesn't stop us from trying. Good morning! Your ruler has risen! Rejoice! And let bellow the horns of birth! Immortal protector of the nation, progeny of the great bloodlines, master of strategies, eternal conductor, and forger of matrimony. Oh, We're go on. Here to advise you on how to handle ruling and commanding. Every time. The horns of battle. Fine, we'll have to do this later. The cadence is attacking. Heroes, jump in. The ruler will be with you shortly. And off they go. We'll explain later. We just need you to take command because our citizens, understandably, find it hard to trust a giant talking chalice. We are not just a giant talking chalice. But the nation will listen to you because you're of their blood. Forged from the bloodlines of the great houses. Oh, and one last thing. Unfortunately, the bloodline ritual that was used to create you also bound you to us. So you can never leave the throne. But do not despair. You can still command your heroes. Look inward, and you will find that your mind can follow them anywhere. Good. Now send someone ahead to scout enemy positions, and then we shall flank through. Hey! What? Oh. Oh, sorry. Old habits. Alright. So here we are in the main tactical flow of the game. And those of you who have played XCOM will be instantly familiar with what you're, a lot of what you're seeing. The orange line is where you can move for one movement. You can still take an action if you move within that range. The white is extended movement. If you move in that range, you cannot also take an action on the same turn. And here you have your five units, uh, three class types to start, and we will go through them uh, by clicking on them one at a time, and the game will give a brief explanation of each one. Here you have the hunter. Attacking at close range is good, but attacking from afar, where one can think and plan, is better. If you listen closely, you might be able to hear your group leaving you behind as you line up that perfect shot. Actually, the hunter will be in front of the group, stealthily scouting ahead. Is that what they say they're doing? This is a caber jack. They hit things with a caber. Sometimes they hit hard and put things down. Other times they hit not so hard and just knock things out. That's all you're going to say? Simplest way of life there is. Caber jacks. Profound purveyors of violence. Ah, you found one of our alchemists. A brilliant mind in a delicate body. Not worth much in a close quarters battle, but they make up for it with their nasty exploding flasks. Just watch out for friendly fire. The explosions are big, so aim well or keep your heroes back. Trust us, you don't want to be on the receiving end of one of their concoctions. Okay, so you have the three basic classes. You have your ranged sniper style class right here that can also move uh, in uh, concealment to try to sneak up on enemies. You have the Caberjack, who is the melee unit and also gets knockbacks and stuns. They also have high hit points, as you can see, compared to the other units for the most part. And then you have the Alchemists, who are your ranged AoE attackers. Uh, they will probably get themselves killed under my watch because, again, my horrible RNG will cause their exploding flasks to explode on all of us. And now, as we move through the level, clearing out the enemies, I will go through each of their backgrounds and stuff and show you some of the details you get on these heroes, some of their traits and things. So, we'll start with Howard Lovecraft. So, as you can see, every hero has a lot of details associated with them. They have their traits, which affect their stats. Uh, Howard here, in true Lovecraft fashion, is of low strength. But he has high HP, which is sort of inverse, I guess. His personality, he's insightful. He has increased intuition. Uh, he's a reveler, so he's a drinker, and he drinks. Well, let's see how well that goes. And then he's a stalwart. Uh, he increases armor's effectiveness. And then as you can see his status below, young age. Um, this game transitions through hundreds of years and your characters actually age in time as you go through that and 
the age affects what a character can do and how the or affects their stats and it affects their fertility rate. Um, since the game takes longer than a single lifespan, it's important that you have generations of people set up. So fertility and having children and bloodlines is actually a very important aspect of this game that we'll get into once we get to the the other side of gameplay outside of combat. And then right here, if Howard had any family, it would be listed here. He unfortunately is apparently an only child. Sucks to be him. And then you have his skills. He's level one right now, so he doesn't have any additional skills. This is the basic skill tree. We'll go through each of the tiers as we unlock them, if we manage to unlock them with any of our heroes. Their equipment. Uh, equipment is upgraded through the course of the game, and it is the same equipment for all members of a class. So once we upgrade our alchemist's gear, all of our alchemists get that upgrade. And then you have his stats. As you saw previously under details, he's not really intelligent, so that it's a uh, minus one, which is great for an alchemist because it's a key stat. Uh, he has reduced, inva reduced evasion and reduced speed. You are not built for war, my friend. Alright. So we shall move him up. Alright. Brian Larico of the Happy Cats. He's brainy, so he has increased intelligence, which isn't bad for a melee caber jack, but it's not great. He's sickly, so he has decreased max HP, which is also wonderfully awesome for a heavy melee tank style character. He's an asthmatic, so his movement is reduced after sprinting in the previous turn. Sprinting is when you move more than the orange radius into the, the white radius. He's a rebel, so his personality traits are run counter to those of his parents and trainers, and he's in prime age, so he has increased hit points and strength. You have his skill, because he's level 2. Uh, he can dash in a straight line to cover more ground and ram characters. He can knock back people when he does this, which is really, really useful. His equipment, as you can see here. And then his stats. He has plus 2 strength, plus 1 intelligence. Ugh, but those hit points. You are also going to die. Come up a little bit. Alright, so on to Daniel Fosse, who is our ranged character. Unlike the others, you can see he has a sibling, who you can also check stats on, which is sort of cool. Uh, he's Hawkeye, he's got increased sight range, that's great for our sniper. He's brainy, and he has low fertility, so he's a decreased chance of having children. He's faint-hearted, so his damage is reduced if he sees an ally die. And he's young. With his skills, he's only level 1, so he doesn't have any of his additional skills yet his equipment, and his stats. Plus one dexterity. Good for him. Minus one intuition. Nobody is without flaws in this universe. Alright, our other range character. Try Hard Die Hard. Oh, that's a great name. I love it. Uh, he's dim-witted, but he's nimble. So, he can juggle, but he doesn't know how many balls he's juggling at the time. Party. He has increased max HP, which is always great. This stat, or this trait particularly, is really good for any class. Uh, things in this game hit hard. They hit for half your life on a regular basis, if not all of your life, if you're not careful. So any increase to, to HP is really, really useful for anyone. He's oblivious, and he's a reveler. So he drinks a lot and doesn't know it. Great. He's on the wagon, though. So he has <laughs> increased health from clean living. I like this exclamation point. And he's young. So we have the skills. Uh, he is level 2, so follow up. It grants a quick hip fire crossbow shot for 50% damage of the first hit. This is really, really good. It's actually one of my favorite early skills in the game. Mainly because if your initial shot hits, the follow up automatically hits. So it's really good for getting additional damage on things when you really need to, to step it up. His equipment, same as the other character. And then his stats. He's plus 4 to dexterity, minus 1 intelligence, and minus 5 intuition. So he's not terrible for combat. And then our other caber jack. Breezy Wear Fury. There you go. Hawkeye, increased sight range, strong willed. And asthmatic. We have two asthmatics. What the heck is going on with our caber jacks? How do they get their caber jack training? Like, you have to carry this giant log everywhere with you and you just can't breathe? Yeah, she's seeing who's talking about her. Uh, she's insightful. 
and she's of prime age. She has a sibling, Wanderwear Fury, who is actually better than she is. Poor Breezy. So her skills, she's only level 1, so she doesn't have any skills unlocked. Her equipment, same as the others, and her stats. She's plus 1 strength, plus 3 hit points, so she's actually going to be our main tank, I think. And we shall move her up as well. She has an asthma attack. And he also has an asthma attack. So many asthma attacks. These people all have horrible diseases and will die terribly from them. So there we go. First catch of the day. We can't tell you much about the cadence because not much is known. It's old, first sighted centuries ago. It cares only for destroying our nation with its corruption. That's where pawns like you see here come in. Think of them as attack dogs the Cadence creates to spread corruption in the world. Alright, so our game plan is to move forward and kill that and all the other that's that are out there. Uh, do you have a shot? You do not. So, we're going to move you forward some more. You better run. Be scared of us. I shouldn't move them too far forward. They're gonna get ahead of the caber jacks. Ah, there you go. More enemies. Seeds. Arguably the lowliest horns are more nuisance than menace. But if you're going to remember one thing, don't let those runts form a posse. Keep them apart. Otherwise, it'll be like when caber jacks get together at a tavern. Except not the best night of your life. Co oh, banter. Um, okay, so one of the cool things about this game, as you amount, is you can see when you're like looking at where you want to move, you can see when you'll have sight and uh, the ability to hit from where you are, which is, I think, a really, really cool feature that's really helpful in positioning your units. We will move conservatively for now. Not wanting to die horribly. They seem indecisive. Lapses. Cadence cowards. They'd rather stay back and snipe at you than fight up close. Be wary. If your heroes are hit, they may forget some of their combat training. The mind is just as vulnerable as the body. So what the game means by that is that lapses, when they hit you, they drain your experience points. They will actually steal your experience points from you, which sucks the big one. So we're going to try to kill hers. Oh, also, lapses explode when they die, which is just wonderful. They don't really do damage when they explode, but they do stun those that are hit, both friend and enemy. So getting to explode near other enemies is very useful to us. Let's give this a shot. down, untold millions to go. Right, so that's good. Let's move up. Keep you here. Let's group everyone together. I'm sure nothing bad can happen when we do that. Alright. I'm going to move up. No. A bit concerned that I can't see anybody. Actually, I'm going to be back a little bit. Get everyone else back here for now. <laughs> that could have been worse. At least they belong to heroic bloodlines. Oh yes, we forgot to mention. Normal humans cannot survive even a single touch from the kings. But because the bloodlines of your heroes are attuned to us and have our power flowing through them, they have a fighting chance. Right, so 
We're going to use you specifically because you're only level 1, and I want to get you as much experience as I can to get up to level 2. Go, Breezy! Oh god, you suck, Breezy. Why did you, like, glancing below? Alright. Who else wants to be level 2? Actually, you're pretty close to level 3. Let's go with that. Or you can suck. That happens too. Oh god, can we take a long shot? Let's take the... Oh, no we can't. I can see everybody and can't hit any of them from here. Alright. Can we see it? Can we hit them now? Where do you have to go to hit? Let's see. Um... Yeah, go for it. There you go, Breezy. I knew you could be a contributor. Mm. Yeah, do it. Oh, did you see the way that one went down? You're in an asthma attack, but you still managed to kill something. A great day. That's okay. I like how it like stared at the it stared at the hunter briefly after getting shot. Like, what the hell are you doing, man? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me is that you're evil. Let's see, you you can finish the job. No, you cannot. Redeemed yourself. <sighs> Another glancing blow. Cabbage Jacks are all just really terrible at life, I guess. Um, give it a shot. Yay, Lovecraft! Alright, so... Can you... Yes, you can. Let's do that. Oh god! You're killing me! All of you! Well, you're mostly killing yourselves, because that's what's gonna happen to you. So we're going to use the ability knockback. Uh, low damage attack that knocks back and stuns enemies, just to show you what it's like when you use them. So you click on the ability, use it, there they go, and you can see that it's stunned now, so it won't act next turn. Next turn will be stun recovery, and then it will start doing cool things again. Bam. Now tell me that wasn't fun. Or it'll never do anything ever again, because now it's dead. So now, we need to move up. I think this is the last one, actually, so... Maybe we'll move forward slightly. Just to draw it out. Have everyone else wait. Or not. I think it just doesn't want to fight. What a lame <coughs> Excuse me. So there we go. 
quite a mind for strategy you have. I had a bit of deja vu watching this one. That skirmish up at Burke's Hollow? The third day of the second battle of Gendor. <laughs> Forgot about that one. With the magpies. Oh yeah. Okay, so you get the end of round or end of um, fight wrap up where you get your bonus experience for the mission. And you get it shows you your kill experience, it shows you how many kills you got. This is really useful to see who contributed the most. Try hard definitely did well. It did not die hard though, which is excellent. Please do never die hard. Never die at all. Alright, so here we are back in the this is the strategy flow of the game now. Outside of combat you have your progression. So at the top you have this timeline that starts in the nebulous past and then you have right now um, which covers your first victory in this game. Over here you have upcoming events. Uh, 300 years from now the chalice will be fully charged and will be able to disband the cadence which is this murky crap encroaching in on you forever. So 300 years, getting to 300 years is ostensibly the goal of this game. It's the victory condition basically. And in that time the 300 years, generations will come and go, families will grow and die, and bloodlines, and you'll advance your, your kingdom and stuff and try to survive and not die horribly. And the way you build out this land, because this is your, your kingdom and possibly the last kingdom in existence that hasn't been destroyed by the kings. You have your chalice, the chalice palace here in the middle, and here you can see current research, and over here you have research options. And you can see there's a large number of things that you have access to. You can build. Uh, building a keep allows you to establish a bloodline, which you put a regent with a partner, and they they create babies, which we will go over shortly. You can build a sage right. A sage right allows you to assign heroes to be sages, and they basically improve research speed and some other things. But they can no longer be in battle after they've done that. Um, the build, the keep, is the same way that once you've established a region a partner, they can no longer be in combat with you, so they are permanently involved in these things. The Crucible allows you to select a hero to train other uh, new heroes, trainees. So they gain an experience boost as they grow up their early life. Uh, heroes don't become available for combat until they're like 18 or so. So during their early life, they're advancing, they're gaining stats and skills and learning from uh, their parents, mostly the regent and the partner, but the crucible allows you to add a bonus to that to help improve them more before they become a fighting age. This allows you to, over time, create stronger and stronger and stronger heroes, which in turn allows you to put a stronger and stronger hero in the crucible so that your your next generation comes in better. Do you have armor upgrades? Uh, armor upgrades apply to all members of a class, so all hunters get this upgrade once you have this upgrade. And if you really want to see the timeline of this game, refining hunter armor, the armors, the very first things are actually relatively fast things, take 16 years. So, and that's a fast thing. I know it's a slow, but that's actually a fast thing that goes relatively quickly. Additionally, you unlock new armor types and new weapons and things by killing numbers of enemies. So once you kill uh, lapses, which are the banshee looking monsters that we fought earlier, they grant you this new armor that you can then research once you've killed enough of them. Weapon upgrades, again, for each of the main classes, allows you to do more damage with them. Items, uh, you have an item slot for each of your heroes, which you can unlock more of later on. Uh, health vials, obviously, which just give you more. They heal you in combat. Uh, different things that do different stuff, which we will go over as we're looking into more research and more ideas for how to not die horribly in this game. So heroes. So you have the option to adopt a baby boy or a baby girl and you can discover new heroes. What this does is it just gives you a smattering of heroes from different classes. This game, more than any other, as far as I know, really requires you to want extra heroes in your docket. So you have your main five that go into combat and you change that up depending on what monsters you're fighting against. Certain classes are better against certain monster types, which we'll look at as we get into it. But with the Sage Rite Guild, the Keeps, needing to establish bloodlines, uh, the Citadel, all that stuff you need extra heroes for, and the fact that they age and then die of old age and can no longer fight because they're dead of old age. No zombies in this game yet. Vampires or liches or whites or revenants or anything like that. 
but you need more heroes and so this game really sort of sells that idea of wanting additional heroes as backups and for the additional things you need to use them for it also means what's really cool is that like we saw earlier we have heroes who just aren't built for combat they have asthma they have low strength they have low hit points so being in the class they're in is not great for what what combat needs from them to not die horribly they can be assigned to these other roles that then gives them purpose and use to you aside from just like a unit I can't use to allow you to advance further so it gives you a lot of ways to deal with the the RNG of having terrible terrible traits on a hero and then you can get a boost to your hero discovery and then your completed stuff we haven't completed anything yet because we just started and then heroes you can see a list of all of your active heroes and you can also check who's in your regency um, standards, stage right, and then trainees and young people. Um, as you can see we have way more heroes than we had for that combat. If they're listed as vanguard, that means that they are currently those five that we're fighting for you. You can change that up before any battle and we will go into the specifics of these heroes and read their backgrounds and stuff as we use them for different things. Alright, so as you can see we have a keep here. Now the keep allows you to appoint a regent and a partner, and what happens is you pick a regent, and the regent and the partner become permanently locked here doing babies, basically. They, they make babies for you forever, until they die. Uh, you can pick them, they are fertile, fertile age, you, can, you generally pick uh, one person and then you pick a partner of the opposite sex so that they can produce offspring. You can pick a partner of the same sex which will not produce offspring naturally but allows you to give them adopted children and when you give them adopted children as in that tooltip that we saw earlier they will still pick up traits and things from their parents so if you have two parents who are the same sex but would have really good traits to pass off to children putting them both in the regency together and then giving them uh, babies to adopt and raise is a viable option and it's actually kind of cool as far as I know um, male and female don't have any statistical bearing on specific heroes other than that they're used to produce uh, offspring. So there's no statistical difference between a male and a female just because of their sex as far as I know. So we want to establish a bloodline here and I'm a huge fan of range classes so we're going to establish the regent as this hunter here level 2 age 20 we should get many many years of fertility out of them they have plus 4 to dexterity because they're prime age um, we can see their details, so we can see if they're actually a really good fit for this. They're nimble, so they have increased dexterity, that's a great trait to hand off to sniper children. They have decreased strength, so we want to make sure they don't wind up having children who are a subclass that's melee, uh, from like a caber check parent. Uh, that would be iffy for us if that's passed on, it's not always passed on. But they have increased intelligence, so being an alchemist subclass also would be fine with them. They're a drunk, and... Um, Drunk parents have drunk kids sometimes, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, Amelia has a sibling, so we will appoint her as the regent. So now, once you appoint the regent, it presents you with the people you can pair them up with, and it lists them in order of chance for offspring, right? So you have super high chance for children. They will just make babies instantly. Uh, and then you have into like normal fertility, high fertility, moderate, and then none. Um, because these are also women, and women plus women don't make babies. Uh, this person is 15. They are very, very young, and they will be around for a long time, as long as we don't get them killed horribly. And as you can see here, it also lists the class that they will produce as offspring. There are several subclasses that depend on the parents. So that if we pair an alchemist with a hunter, we get a trick shot who is sort of a mix of the two, an alchemist that does ranged attacks. Yeah. It's actually a really good class. So, as you can see, pairing them with a Caberjack gives you an Enforcer, which is more of a defense, survival-oriented class. And if you pair them with a member of the same class, you get the same class. So if you needed more Hunters, just you like really like base Hunter, because the base classes are all really effective in a lot of ways. You could just do that and take that. But we are going to go with this, because it's a great option for us. Um, it gives us trick shots, which is a class I like. We can look at Paul's details. Paul has a snazzy do. He looks like a King Cobra, really, if you look at him. But he's an idiot. 
Well, goody. Um, will that balance out with our other, with our high intelligence? Or do we run the risk of some of them being stupid and some of them being really smart? And then when they're kids, they fight with each other because the smart ones all gang up on the stupid ones. Uh, he has an increased chance of having children, though, so we can produce a lot of offspring and then only collect the viable ones. Sure. It's a video game. Don't worry about it. Uh, he's insightful, and he is young, so these two will produce offspring for a long time. Uh, we can, however, check to see if we have more alchemists that would be a better fit. Uh, there we go. Let's look at your details. He has increased intelligence. He's impressionable. Uh, he has increased movement range. Oh, he is a much better fit, even though his his fertility is lower. Well, actually, no, his fertility is the same, isn't it? Okay, so we will go with Carter, Carter UA, who we will we will put here. Confirm, and it will confirm with you that this is what you want to do. You can't change this back. Yes. All right. So now, once we start time, they will start producing offspring for us, and that will be really really cool. That will help bolster our forces 18 years from now. Uh, and then as you can see we have a bunch of empty terrain. You can build, as you saw here in the build menu, you can research new buildings. So we're going to research a keep first uh, so that we can start another regency and establish another bloodline to give us more heroes. And you have your options. The cadence attacks in from the outside. So these outside areas are more likely to get attacked first. And these triangle diamonds represent Try diamonds represent uh, the corruption. If you lose a fight in an area or don't respond to it, you get a mark of corruption. If an area gets three marks, then it becomes completely corrupted and you can no longer use it. But building in these outside areas, as you can see, offers bonuses like uh, increased training XP, uh, plus strength, reduced construction time, which is really good. So these inner areas, while safer, don't offer any any bonuses to building in them. So we are going to want to go with outside area that gives us something good. Training XP would be good, but not yet, not until we build our citadel. So um, we will go with reduced construction time because that will just help us for the rest of the game, really, as long as we can maintain this area. It will help us build everything faster. So we're going to set that up. So as you can see, we started building our keep. It appears on our timeline. As, or an upcoming event, as in seven years we will have built our keep. And we can see our other events here. We had our marriage that we established. And we appointed a regent, so it keeps track of the things you did. You can go back through the timeline and search. And then when you hit play, it starts progressing through the years. And we will stop this video here, and we will hit play at the start of the next video. Uh, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time.